Hello and welcome to another tutorial video. We're going to be discussing something called the times interest earned ratio or tie ratio, also known as the interest coverage ratio in this tutorial. I'm going to go through the main points here and then show you an example spreadsheet from a very simple LBO model, which lays out the calculations for this ratio and explains some of the nuances. Now I'll say up front that this is a topic with a lot of CME content, which you can pretty easily find online from some simple searches. A lot of these articles just make the same points repeatedly, but I want to focus a little bit more on the nuances here and the why behind the numbers. So we will go through the basics, but I want to spend more time on the more complex points with this one. For all the files and resources, you'll want to go to this link on screen on our financial statement analysis knowledge base page and times interest earned tie. I will link to this. I'll pin this as the first comment below the video as well as so you can just click through and get everything there. So the tie ratio times interest earned measures how well a company's core business earnings can pay for the interest expense on its debt. And it represents the credit risk and also the company's capacity for new debt issuances and what the terms of those issuances might be everything from the interest rate to any original issue discount offered to the cash versus paid in kind interest components on that debt. Now, if you want to calculate the tie ratio in an aggressive way, you can take the company's EBITDA earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization and divide by the interest expense. If you want to use a more conservative ratio, you can take the company's EBIT earnings before interest and taxes and divide by that same interest expense. Now, this one's aggressive because EBITDA, by definition, is always greater than or equal to EBIT. So this tie ratio has to be greater than or equal to this more conservative tie ratio down below. So if a company has 10 million in EBITDA, 8 million in EBIT, and a $2 million interest expense, the tie is either 5x if you use EBITDA, or if you use EBIT, it would be 4x. The acceptable level for the tie ratio varies a lot by industry and company and current market norms, but generally speaking, lenders like to see numbers of at least 2x, and for high quality or higher quality companies, they like to see numbers more in the 3x, 4x, or even higher range to make sure there's plenty of coverage and that the company can easily pay for its interest expense. If a company has numbers in that range, it should be able to raise debt more easily or raise debt on more favorable terms, such as at lower interest rates or with less restrictive covenants or restrictions on what the company can do and the financial ratios it must maintain. Of course, this assumes that its other stats, like the fixed charge coverage ratio, the debt service coverage ratio, the leverage ratio also look good at the same time. If a company has lower numbers, it's not necessarily a red flag, but it could indicate that maybe it will cost more to issue debt or that it might have difficulty issuing debt above and beyond a certain level. Now, the complexities to the tie ratio are that, first off, there are cash components and non-cash components to the interest. So we've covered before in this channel concepts like the paid in kind interest, the original issue discount, and even points like the amortization of issuance fees associated with the debt. Now, some people will look at these and say that these are non-cash, so they shouldn't really affect the company's ability to pay for interest expense because they're not actually cash expenses in the period, but you can make counter arguments against that claim as well. Lease interest can also complicate things, especially if you're looking at companies that follow IFRS. The treatment of interest income is debatable as well because some people will say it should offset some of the interest expense. Some people would say that it shouldn't be counted there at all. So it really depends on the purpose of your analysis. If you want to measure the company's cash coverage of its interest expense, then maybe these points aren't important. But if you're trying to measure the cost of issuing new debt or the company's ability to issue it, then some of these points could factor in a lot more. So just to show you a simple example in this LBO model, we have a very simple, smaller company here. We have a lot of different components for the interest expense, cash interest, paid in kind interest, interest income, the lease interest, the debt discount amortization, the issuance fee amortization, and all of these are part of the net interest expense. When you go down here and calculate the times interest earned ratio, the numbers here don't really seem too good. In fact, they seem quite concerning because we have numbers between 1.3x and 2.5x, which is below what most lenders would like to see. And so this tells us that either the interest rates on this should be relatively high, the other terms should be quite restrictive, or that maybe this is about the maximum debt the company can currently raise. The thing to be careful of here is that, depending on how you calculate this, if you use EBITDA, for example, instead of EBIT, and maybe you decide not to count any of these things up here, so all these non-cash components or 
interest on non-debt items like leases, you could get a completely different result. With this calculation, the times interest to earn ratio looks much healthier. It's more like 2.8x to 4.9x. So the point of this is to show you just how sensitive this calculation is to basic definitions and arguments about how to actually use this in real life. So in this tutorial, I'm gonna start by going into that topic in a bit more detail and talking about some of the different definitions and trade-offs and how you calculate this. Then I'll talk about what it tells you at a high level. And then we'll talk about how companies can boost their own times interest earned ratios. So let's go to the definitions first. With the numerator, there really isn't too much debate. You either use EBIT or EBITDA, depending on how conservative you want to be. You generally do not make cash flow adjustments because if you're gonna start adjusting for things like capital expenditures or the change in working capital, you might as well just use something like the fixed charge coverage ratio or the debt service coverage ratio to capture those types of lines and get something that's more closely related to the company's cash flows. With the non-cash interest components, typically these mean that the cost of debt is higher than what is implied by the company's cash interest expense. So if a company has $70 in cash interest, 20 in paid and kind interest, and 10 from the original issue discount amortization, you can't really say that the cost of debt is just 7% if the company has a $1,000 debt balance. You can't just take 70 and divide by 1,000. You have to factor in these other components. The paid and kind interest will add something. That'll be another 2%. And then the original issue discount amortization here will add around another 1% to this. If investors were really satisfied with earning just 70 and accepting a 7% cost of debt, they would have accepted it. The company would have had no reason to offer these additional terms like the paid in kind interest or to give the investors an upfront discount. These other components mean that the cost of debt is effectively higher for the company even though the cash cost after the issuance doesn't actually seem higher. So the bottom line is that we recommend including these non-cash interest components if you're estimating credit risk and the cost of future issuances. But if your main concern is the company's ability to pay for its interest expense in the current period, maybe these aren't quite so important. With lease interest and interest income, we would generally not recommend including lease interest. Interest income is also a little bit questionable. It tends to be very small, but the issue is that a high cash balance or any cash balance doesn't necessarily offset the risk of debt because not all debt can actually be repaid early. So for those reasons, we don't really recommend including these components in most cases. So let's go back to the Excel file. I'm gonna bring up an example with all these line items deleted and then I'll go through it and explain what we would recommend doing in this case. Okay, so here we are in our tie calculations. And for this, we really recommend setting up data validation. So Alt DL in Excel and then go to list and source and only allow EBIT or EBITDA right here. So we created a drop down menu with these. For the paid in kind interest expense, we would recommend including this. We don't recommend counting interest income. We don't recommend counting the lease interest, but we do recommend counting the debt discount amortization and the issuance fee amortization. With the debt discount amortization, the issue here is that if we're giving investors a 5% discount on the 500 million in debt, then we don't really get 500 million in proceeds from this, we only get 475 million in proceeds, but we're still paying around this 10% interest rate on the 500 million of debt. So that's why we do recommend factoring this in. The issuance fees are a smaller matter and they always come with debt issuances. So you'll see varied treatment here, but for consistency, we do recommend counting this as well. You can also see the original issue discount and the financing fees in the uses side of the sources and uses schedule, reflecting how it means that more funding is needed to do this deal. So then moving down for the numerator, we can just do a simple if check and we can look at this. And if this equals our EBITDA right here, then we can link to the EBITDA on the company's income statement. Otherwise, we'll just link to EBITDA minus depreciation and amortization, in other words, EBIT. And so we have that. So that's how we can set up the basics there. Now with the denominator, there's really no argument about the cash interest expense. It's impossible to argue that this should not be counted. So we can go up to the income statement where we have the cash interest and we can just reverse this because we're going to be showing the interest expense as a positive here for this calculation. For the paid in kind interest expense, this one is more debatable. So we can take the number right here and then we can multiply by our switch up here at the top. So cell K22, I will anchor the K part because we want that to stay in place but we want the rows to be able to move down as we copy and paste this down. For the interest income, 
it's very similar. We have the interest income right there. I am saying no for the switch. And so this just gets multiplied by zero. And so we don't count this. For the lease interest, same idea. We're taking our lease interest. We are reversing the sign, but we're saying that this should not count. So we have that. For the debt discount amortization, I'll copy and paste this down. And same idea here. We're taking the original issue discount of 25. This debt matures in five years. So we're dividing by five and we're recording five for this in each year. And our switch here is set to yes. And then the issuance fee amortization is also set up like that. And so we can copy this across. And overall, we get a somewhat better result than we initially saw right here. But I would say for the first few years, it is still a little bit concerning that the times interest earned ratio here is below 2x. But this is how we would ideally calculate it for a company like this. Now, moving on, what does this ratio actually tell you? The analogy I would use is that it's a little bit like going to the doctor and getting a blood test. You can't just look at the results of one number in a blood test taken on a single date and say much. It's more about the whole picture. You wanna look at multiple different numbers. You wanna look at ideally how those numbers have trended over time and what they're telling you. So with the times interest earned ratio, you want to look at metrics like the debt to EBITDA or leverage ratio, the fixed charge coverage ratio, the debt service coverage ratio. And if the tie is low, but the rest are fine, maybe the company can raise new debt on similar terms to the existing debt, but it depends a little bit on why the tie ratio is actually low. If multiple metrics are low, then it's going to be more difficult. And maybe the company can raise new debt, but it might have to pay a significantly higher interest rate to do so. So looking at our example here, I've already calculated some of these ratios just to save us some time. The leverage ratio is not really that high for this company. It starts out around the 4X level and then falls to more like two to three X. So that seems fine. But the fixed charge coverage ratio here is definitely on the low side below two X. Although for many lenders, the minimum is more like 1.5 X. So I would say the bottom line here is that this company could probably raise additional debt but if it did so, it would probably have to pay more than the 10% or the 11% or slightly more than 11% if you also count the issuance fees. So right now, they're effectively paying the paid in kind interest plus the cash interest plus the original issue discount divided by the maturity plus the debt issuance fee percentage divided by the maturity. So they're paying around 11.4% for their cost of debt. If they were to raise new debt, then maybe they would have to do it at 12% or 13% or some other number that is slightly higher than our estimate of around 11% for their current cost of debt. And that's what the numbers here are telling you. Now, if we got to much worse numbers, like 6X for the leverage ratio, 1X for the fixed charge coverage ratio, under 1X for the times interest earn ratio, then that might be a sign that the company could not actually raise additional debt right now. How can companies boost their tie ratios. The overall goal here is to maintain or increase the numerator. So the EBIT or EBITDA while reducing the interest expense denominator. So one idea would be to refinance debt and replace it with lower cost debt in exchange for certain concessions. For example, maybe they have stricter covenants, so their activities are more limited or they have to maintain more financial ratios. Another idea is to cut costs via headcount reduction or lease or supplier renegotiations, kind of like Doge in real life except someone in charge could actually make it work properly. Another idea might be to grow the core business so that the higher EBIT and EBITDA in the future reduce the tie. Maybe it's not going to do anything this year or next year, but five years down the line, it might make the numbers look better. So just to show you a few simple examples, if we were to renegotiate the debt here and to somehow get much lower interest rates, the tie ratio would certainly improve. It goes up to more like two to three X in the first few years now at these much lower interest rates, but we don't know what we have to give up to get these. If we had much higher growth rates, so maybe 15% growth, 13%, 11%, something like this, the tie ratio doesn't change that much now, but it does improve quite a bit by these later years in the period. So these are just a few examples. You can also look at other things like improving margins, but frankly, this company already has a pretty high EBITDA margin. So we don't know how much room there is to improve there. That's about it. So let's do a quick recap and summary. Tie definitions in a simple LBO model. So at a basic level, you're taking EBIT or EBITDA and dividing by interest expense. In our view, you should count cash and paid in kind interest, and you should count the amortization of any debt discounts or premiums and the issuance fee amortization, but not the interest income and lease expense. EBIT versus EBITDA is really up to you and depends what you're doing. EBIT is more conservative, but EBITDA 
is more appropriate if you're actually looking at the cash coverage of the interest expense. What does Thai tell you? It depends what the other ratios are showing. In this case, the numbers are not terrible, but the Thai ratio is on the low side, the fixed charge coverage ratio is on the low side, the leverage ratio is mostly fine. So in this case, it tells us that the company could probably raise some additional debt, but they probably pay a bit extra or accept less favorable terms to do so. How can companies boost their ties? They can renegotiate the debt and try to get lower interest rates. They can try to grow organically. They can try to cut costs or become more efficient. All those make some difference and the most viable one depends on what the company's current financial stats look like. So that's it for our coverage of the tie ratio. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about this and understand some of the nuances that you tend not to see in other sources.